Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the third of our intercropping webinar series. So, so far we've covered some impacts of nutrient disease as well as our producer experiences. So um, hopefully everybody's been learning lots. Um, today is really exciting. We are talking about the latest research in intercropping. Uh, we have two really great speakers for you. Um, this webinar series has been brought to you by uh, Lakeland Agricultural Research Association, so I work there. Um, I'm Kelly Nichpork. Um, we also have Johanna from uh, Peace Country Beef and Forage Association, um, as well as the North Peace Applied Research Association has been um, also in support of this. Uh, so our first speaker is Alan Lee. He's a graduate student at the University of Alberta under the supervision of Dr. Akeem Omokanye and Dr. Ramirez. Um, he's been working exclusively uh, with agricultural research plots. Um, prior to his graduate studies, he completed a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from the U of A as well. Uh, for his presentation today, he'll be walking through the results of his research in, in the intercrop project, as well as talking about how practical intercropping is as a production alternative. So I'll turn it over to Alan. Thank you. And um, I will pull up my screen for us. Here we go. And... There we go. So yeah, the intercropping research that we did up in the peace country in Fairview specifically is the oat, pea and canola intercropping. So it's kind of a look into how intercropping can benefit uh, in terms of forage quality and what exactly is causing intercropping to actually work the way it does. Now, um, just kind of an outline of what we're gonna go through. Uh, of course, a brief introduction to what intercropping is for those that don't really know, and a little bit more about what I actually studied, which is intercropping and the water use efficiency of intercropping, as well as the underlying mycorrhizae that is potentially causing the effects that we see in intercropping. So as you can see, forage quality and quantity, we'll talk a little bit about the yield biomass that we got from all the intercropping, as well as its yield nutritive values. So your crude protein, ADF, NDF, and a little bit about what the energy levels are. Um, and we'll start talking about water use efficiency. So how much water is being converted into the yield and then how much water uptake it takes through the whole entire season. And then with the mycorrhizae, it's a little bit to talk about some new findings that we've noticed from this research specifically, which is where there are differences in the abundance of mycorrhizae when you intercrop versus when you don't. And then of course, the little conclusions that we found that could tie in everything together and kind of give you an insight as to what intercropping means for a farmer. So for the introduction, what is intercropping? Essentially, it's growing more than one plant in a plot in the same season. And what that does in general is trying to promote the whole idea of having more productivity in one piece of land. So in, in the sense where if you have one crop, you have a productivity of one crop, but maybe with intercropping, with two crops, you can have the productivity of two crops in the same plot, which is kind of what we've been trying to see. It's kind of what we call overyielding in that sense. So overyielding is where you are yielding more than what you would have in the same plot. And generally what we have found with research, if a lot of research overseas in China and in Europe, is that you will be overyielding roughly um, basically twice to three times as much as what you would have in a single plot of land by intercropping than you would in just sole cropping, just cropping your wheat, your oats, your uh, canola and whatnot. And also to close about how it has better water use efficiency. So essentially because we're growing more crops in one piece of land, it's more effectively using the water that is being put into the soil to produce yield. And it's the same thing as nutrient use efficiency because it is able to use different mechanisms to in, uh, basically uptake the nutrients. It's more likely to completely use the nutrients that you give the plants in that same scenario. And of course, because you are putting multiple plants into one plot, 
the harvest that you get from it should be more nutritionally balanced for beef cattle. So this would be meeting most of the mineral requirements, meeting most of the crude protein requirements, as well as ADF and NDFs that generally is required for beef cattle, just so that they're more palatable. So what is mycorrhizae? Mycorrhizae is fungus. It's essentially um, not, you know, the mushrooms that you see everywhere. It's a little bit different. It's, um, it's little filaments in the ground that kind of interconnect um, and create this giant, um, what do you call it, network for nutrients and water to travel between each other. Now, what we've noticed with research is that they can also attach to plants. And we're thinking, in, because research has told us that it's capable for perennials such as trees and bushes to transfer nutrients between each other, that potentially even in annuals, we can do the same thing. This is what we've been thinking about. And so um, if you can see the slide here, it kind of talks about how plants produce exudate. So it, plants, plant roots actually release basically chemicals or um, specific nutrients that fungus or mycorrhizae would basically be interested in. And because of that, they will attach itself to the plant root and basically demand for this stuff in return for other nutrients that is generally not accessible by the plant. And so this is why we call this the mycorrhizal symbiosis. And this is probably more than what you need to know for this topic. And then we can dive into a little bit about the uh, research itself. So the project is done in Fairview, Alberta at the PCBFA research farm between 2019 and 2020. And of course, if you know research to some degree, generally it's not the best to have it in one plot and it's better to do it over multiple plots, but we had our limitations and we could only do it there. So take some of this with a grain of salt. This is almost close to preliminary, although they are results in the end. So how did we set this up? We set this up with three crops that we know are very commonly used around the peace country. So that's oats, it's peas, and it's canola. And we did it with all the different iterations. So you see your oat pea, pea canola, oat canola, and the three mixes together, oat pea canola, as well as four um, nitrogen rates that we applied to it besides the basic fertilizer needs that we tested for every year. So we want to see what would happen if we had no fertilizer all the way up to 100 kilograms per hectare, which is, I think, roughly around 100 pounds per acre as well, if not a little less or a little more. So now we come to the forage quantity and quality part. Now, how we did this was basically the same way you would do it is to harvest the plots to a certain size and then send it in to... Um, a laboratory to have it tested for the nutrients that it has. Now the difference would be that we have to measure our little plot to make sure that we know how much pounds per acre that we get from it and then kind of convert it into something that is more understandable in terms of how we look at yield. Um, and then afterwards, we did do a calculation for nitrogen use efficiency. So this is where we took how much nitrogen we put in compared to how much yield that we got to get kind of a, what do you call it, an index to compare between the different types of intercropping that we have in our system. And of course, we use statistics to kind of process this so that you'd have a better understanding of, you know, if it is very different or if it's just kind of, you know, they're similar, they're way too similar for us to say that it's actually a benefit. So for the results, of course, this is biomass yield. Um, what you notice is that with the oats, which is at the very left side, they're consistently high, which means, you know, oats is definitely the preferable method of growing quality or quantity in terms of biomass yield. Um, so in that sense, you're not getting much of a benefit from it. But what you do notice is that there are some intercropping treatments over here. If you look more towards the right in the first box, um, you see that oats and canola is performing way better than any of the oat treatments. 
And of course, the second one in 2020, you'll notice oat P is performing a lot better than oats in any of those treatments as well. So what we're trying to get here is the fact that intercropping is capable of doing what we call overyielding, but we need to be a little bit more um, thorough in figuring out what exactly is causing it. And clearly with this research, we're not getting that result that we wanted. Now coming to nitrogen use efficiency, what we notice very interestingly, the first thing we notice is how well intercropping is actually converting nitrogen into yield. It is more consistently higher than a lot of the um, oat, pea, and canola by itself. And um, it does it very good in both years. Now, um, I forgot to mention this, but in 2019 and 2020, the biggest difference is that 2019 was uh, pretty dry in comparison to 2020, where 2020 had a massive downpour halfway through the season that basically made it so that nutrients were very, very accessible for the plants itself. So with the discussion, we come to the point that we're talking about how overyielding is indeed possible. However, what's more important is noticing, let's go back to the picture of the biomass yield again, is actually how stable intercropping is in terms of producing qual quantity. Now, uh, in both 2019 and 2020, the intercropping treatments are producing roughly around 7.5 megagrams per hectare. So in kilo or pounds per acre, it's roughly around 8,000. So it's very consistent there in both 2019 and 2020. Now, this is kind of telling us that if we wanted to uh, brace for impact for how extreme the climates are going to get. So if it's going to get too hot or it's going to get too cold, too dry or too wet, intercropping is good, really good at holding itself at a very specific yield. So if it comes to the point where we're trying to manage crop failure, this would be a very good choice to choose. This is what we have noticed. Um, now, we were talking about nitrogen use efficiency. What we were thinking before we got to looking at water use efficiency is that better water use could be the reason for better nitrogen use efficiency. And this is how, what we're going to talk about just in a second. So with water, we kind of measured it with moisture sensors, moisture and temperature sensors, where we've installed it at the 15 centimeter point, which is roughly around six inches down. And then another one at 12 inches, which is for us 30 centimeter point to measure what the mo moisture is like between the different crops that we've chosen. And we couldn't choose every one of them. So we used um, oats, peas, and canola, and two of the combination Oat P, oh, three of them, Oat P, P canola, and oat, um, oat canola. So those are the combinations that we had to kind of look at. And so we calculated with, with the values that we got from the moisture sensor, we calculated water use efficiency for biomass and water use efficiency for crude protein. So this is kind of a look at what the moisture levels are in the soil, whereas the top two, are at the 15 centimeters or the six inches and the bottom two are the 30 centimeter or at the 12 inch level. And um, you can kind of tell with 2020, which is the right side here, 2020 had that massive rainfall that penetrated through both 15 centimeter layers and the 30 centimeter layers, which is why you get this massive um, increase down the center at roughly, I would say July-ish. I'm not mistaken, that causes this to come down. We will also notice in uh, 2019, we see very consistent rainfall so that the moisture isn't actually penetrating down to the 30 centimeter layer as well as it did in 2020. This is kind of important to look at because um, it shows how dry in comparison 2019 is to 2020. Now, um, so the first picture is our precipitation compared to the different treatments that we had, which is oats, peas, canola, 
oats peas and peas canola. So there was an oat canola one, but that was kind of a mistake in terms of where we put the sensor. But either way, this chart basically shows us that there are differences between oats, peas, canola, oat pea, and pea canola. Now, how important the difference is are, I will talk about a little bit later when we come to the table that I have later. But in the same time, we also did zero fertilizer versus 75 kilograms per hectare, which is roughly about 80 pounds per acre um, of N nitrogen from the system and saw that there is very, there is a difference, but it's more significant when there is rainfall compared to when there isn't rainfall. And so when it came to the differences, we do notice that intercropping is pretty good in terms of using water use, it has really good water use efficiency. It converts it into, um, what is it, biomass yield pretty good. But in terms of water uptake, it's, it's a whole different story there. Um, let me just quickly go through this. Yeah, so when it comes to uh, water use efficiency in terms of biomass yield, once again, I would say take it with a grain of salt. It's very inconsistent, but we can see that intercropping is very effective in terms of that. But when it comes to water uptake, it, it seems that for whatever reason, intercropping uses, a, it doesn't take as much water as it does in um, compared to oats, peas, and canola. Now, you can almost say that it's a good thing. And this is probably why you're seeing very stable uh, biomass yield in, um, the first bit of it because it doesn't need that much water to produce the amount of yield that it produces. And when there is less water coming down, you're not needing to scrounge for water as much as you would as the um, oat pea canola by itself would. And so we come to this part, we'll just briefly talk about how we're thinking that intercropping is also kind of necessary to think about, it kind of preemptively think about what the season's coming will be because uh, different intercropping systems react differently to different um, climates. And as you can see, I'm trying to point out the fact that there are two different intercrops that are performing differently in two different years. <laughs> Peas and canola was producing better, I think, was it? It was producing better in the wetter year. Wetter year. Yeah, it was producing better in the wetter year than oats and peas in the drier year. And so with that in mind, it's really good to kind of think about how you want to prepare for the future years because with intercropping, choosing the right intercrops same, same thing with, I guess, when you do um, just your normal generic cropping, if you choose it right, you will have better yield. Uh, but the only caveat that we've had is noticing that, you know, the, the, the rain actually saturated all the way through to the 30 centimeters in our plots. So there might be a chance that these roots are actually penetrating a lot deeper than what our sensors are capable of measuring. So. Um, there will be further research needed to kind of clarify as to how water is actually being uptaken by these plants. And um, hopefully there is more research done on this topic. And moving on to mycorrhizae, this is my personal favorite part because it's, it's something brand new for everybody here. It's, um, we don't talk about this a lot simply because in annual crops, not a lot of people think that mycorrhizae is capable of penetrating roots within the year that the plant is grown. Uh, th this, on the other hand, proves it otherwise. It's actually kind of interesting. 
So um, what we did was basically once we planted the uh, crops, um, halfway through the season where it was roughly around uh, early flowering stage, we took samples from the roots, um, basically took massive plugs around 15 centimeters deep to have uh, complete soil samples and complete root samples just to see the difference between what's in the soil and what's in the root and what we can find in terms of these fungus. And so it goes a little deeper than just seeing if there is um, fungal uh, filaments in the soil. So we use DNA this time and what DNA does for us is that it can basically capture the whole entire uh, snapshot of what is in a soil and what is in a root. And because we have a decent sized database, we are able to classify most of it in terms of, I think, yeah, families. We have them in families. So it's not as detailed as species because once we get into the species, there's way too many and none of them have names and we don't really know what they do yet. So here's a picture of what we found out in terms of abundance and diversity. So abundance and diversity is basically talking about how many species are present and how many species are different from each other. So what we can see here is that in the A uh, row of the things, there isn't much of a difference in terms of diversity. And um, there isn't much of a difference in terms of abundance. And why is that? It's because it's in the soil. So the soil is essentially the pool of all the mycorrhizae that's in your soil. And um, they're not, there's not going to be differences between plots because they're always going to be there. But in terms of where the roots are, this is where it gets interesting. So this, this specific um, picture is from 2019. And you'll start noticing in the roots, you are having different um, levels of abundance depending on what the treatment is. So in the first column where it says chow one, the oats are different when you put fertilizer in than when you don't. So it's more abundant when you have no fertilizer in the soil. In the peas, however, it's the other way around. It's where um, you have less abundance of mycorrhizae in the peas than you would when you don't have a fertilizer compared to when you do. And this, this is kind of, um, if it makes any sense, it's because um, when you inoculate peas, you inoculate it with this thing called rhizobia. And it's basically competing with mycorrhizae to infect the roots in peas. And that's why when you add fertilizer to it, the rhizobia no longer needs to infect the pea roots to get nitrogen. And so mycorrhizae in turn take over and infect the roots itself. But what's interesting is when you put oats and peas together, your abundance now becomes very consistent. Now they are all the same, even though you put fertilizer versus when you don't. And why is that? It's, um, it's not very clear, but if I were to guess, it is because the oats are taking up the nitrogen while the peas are still being inoculated by rhizobia. And so even though they are together, they're using completely different resources to get nutrients. And this is why we have very similar abundance, whether or not you put fertilizer in. You can kind of interpret it however you want, whether it's, you know, a good thing that you don't put fertilizer since you can save a lot of money on that or whatever. That's completely up to you. Now, this is 2019. I probably should have shown this earlier. So I'll do that with the 2021 because there's also a slight difference in between that. Now, once again, you look at the 2020 soil, there's absolutely no difference. But when you look at the 2020 roots, we start seeing that okay, maybe the abundance isn't too much of a difference because the rainfall has made it so that everyone has equal access to everything. So equal access means not really too much to be um, touched on. 
But in terms of diversity, this is where it gets ever so slightly interesting. We did find significance in this. So this is where oats and peas are different in terms of diversity. So that means they have different uh, mycorrhizae infecting them. That's why there's a difference like this. There is more diversity in peas than there are in oats. But once you put them together, their diversity becomes the same. Very similar. Now, for speculation, we're thinking that it's because oats and peas have overlapping mycorrhizae groups. And when you put them together, the over overlapping groups aren't going to get bigger. They're not going to suddenly increase in volume or anything. They're just going to do the same things. But instead of for just one plant, it'll do it for both plants. And this is kind of where we're going to think about maybe this is why, in terms of producing biomass yield, you have a more consistent but lower value than you would if you were to just plant oats, canola, and peas by itself. They are essentially using the same resources. And this picture might confuse you a little bit, but it, it's pretty simple to understand in the sense that if the circles aren't overlapping each other, it means that they're very different. And so with the top part, we have the crops, the oat, the pea, and the oat and pea compared with each other. And they are ever so slightly different in terms of what their uh, diverse um, pools of mycorrhizae is. But you will notice that every single time we see these pictures on top, these two A and B, that oat and pea just happens to be in the center. So that means oats and peas do share a lot in common in terms of their species that they collect. And by combining them into one plot, you're actually taking advantage of both, um, both species from both plants. And what's interesting is looking at C and D. This is uh, us comparing the root um, diversity versus the soil diversity. The fact that soil and root are so incredibly different is telling us that the soil has so many different um, fungal species that the roots can take from so that you can create or essentially the roots will never actually run out of mycorrhizae to choose from. And so with that in mind, it's thinking about what you can do to create an intercropping system that takes full advantage of the soil's environment. And this is kind of where we might be talking about doing soil tests, soil DNA tests to see what is most valuable for growing a crop. And this helps a lot because if you use mycorrhizae to collect nutrients, perhaps you don't need to use as much fertilizer as you would typically do, um, just simply because of how efficient mycorrhizae can be in certain scenarios. Oh, and um, probably kind of interesting is you really do, this is, this is a really good image to show because this shows how important it is to take care of your soil. Between 2019 and 2020, we're seeing a slight shift um, in mycorrhizal communities, as you can see here in A. And um, the shift means that whatever you plant in the plot um, will basically change what the mycorrhizal community in the soil will be for the next year. Now, I'm not saying that mycorrhizae is definitely the way to go for growing crops, but it's definitely something to consider when you're looking at plants. So this is, this is a whole bunch of um, different uh, genus that we've um, classified to kind of give us a snapshot of what could be affecting uh, plants in general. So between oats and peas, one of the biggest ones that we noticed is paraglomus. Another one is diversus spora. And the last one is clerigioglomus. Uh, I probably wouldn't keep those in mind, but from what we saw in our research, these three are important in the sense that 
there's a chance that paraglomas is helping either the oats and the peas in terms of uh, creating more nutrients for the plant because it does change quite a fair bit um, in the roots between 2019 and 2020. So well, very similar actually. The, the reaction is the same. Whereas um, you see more paraglomas um, in the oat and pea combinations than you would in by itself by uh, oats and peas. It's kind of telling us, you know, um, the chain. Well, more specifically, when paraglomas um, was present in oats and pea combinations in 2019 versus 2020, it would seem that it would fluctuate depending on how well one of the plants was doing versus the other. And because of that, we can kind of have an idea thinking to ourselves saying that one of these plants it values paraglomas a lot. And it's probably a good idea to make sure that you keep a healthy group of it in your soil. The other one is Diversospora. And this one is just kind of present. It changes from, um, what is it? The, the presence of it disappears when you intercrop versus when you don't. It's very valuable to one of the plants when you um, when they are by themselves. It's apparently a key factor. I don't really know what it does since we didn't do more research on it, but um, in a lot, a lot of research papers, it is one of the valued um, groups that we see in the mycorrhizal um, groupings. Now, what's interesting, the most interesting one of them all is probably the Clarigioglomus. The Clarigioglomus um, genus basically fluctuates according to how much rain is in the soil. So when you see, when there was a higher abundance of Clarigioglomus, it was because there was a lot more rain in there. And we're starting to question basically um, what they are, uh, what they are capable of doing. And um, it's probably a good time to kind of bring this up to more communities, more research communities to kind of take a look at what the mycorrhizal species are doing whenever you have good yield and whenever you have bad yield. And um, of course, now that we've identified three of these from this project, we can go forwards in kind of identifying what they do instead of, you know, um, just knowing that they exist to do something in the soil. So um, kind of free capital is just talking about the mycorrhizal diversity increases with intercropping. It really does. So that having diversity in an environmental perspective is great because you are increasing how much stuff wants to live in the soil. This is really good because that means whenever you come back to plant more stuff, your plants are more likely to survive because it, it, it already has an environment for it. Now, mycorrhizal richness will differ under drier conditions. This is something that we notice because in drier conditions, your plants need to basically try to get nutrients. It's um, because a lot of the nutrients, I believe some of them, such as phosphorus and sulfur are immobile nutrients. In those cases, you have to try extra hard. Your roots have to grow to actually access them. And so with that case, the mycorrhizal richness will differ simply because uh, the different plants will use different methods in acquiring um, nutrient. So some cases you will have them using more uh, mycorrhizae to grab nutrients sometimes because you're you have enough nutrients you can just grow your roots out you will just grow your roots out and then you will have less mycorrhizal abundance and um, as I was talking about it device spora could be a key genus for species just simply because you're seeing more diverse spora in peas than you are in oats and you see some of it in oats and peas and then paraglomus, as I said earlier, was probably used to determine P if peas are under stress. And we're still not sure if it's just if peas are under stress or if oats are just 
proliferating. And this is just kind of our guess in the meantime, while more research is to be done. And conclusions. So we were talking about is intercropping or what intercropping can benefit you from? And is intercropping for forage an improvement? Um, it's debatable. Whether you want stability is your key cause, then yes, the answer is intercropping does produce stability. If you want to produce more than your conventional cropping, uh, I would say it's very hard. We don't need a lot more research to kind of show that we can actually produce more than conventional cropping. Although research has been pointing towards overyielding, what this research and a lot of the data that is available is pointing towards just simply there, you're not creating more biomass yield. You're just um, in terms of productivity, producing more. And um, intercropping is more nitrogen or is more of nutrient efficient. <laughs> it's very efficient at using nutrients. But, you know, the caveat being is that it doesn't need as much nutrients and it definitely won't produce as much as your um, oats and your peas that are genetically modified to just eat a lot of nutrients in general. The water use efficiency and water uptake, as I said earlier, intercropping definitely is the better choice if you're trying to grow crops in a dry area or if you're trying to conserve water if you have irrigation. Of course, um, up in the peace country, we don't have irrigation or at the farm. So ours was just basically seeing whether it would stand the task against water stress, which it did fairly well, as you can see, given that the yield was so stable in both 2019 and 2020. Uh, where was I? Yeah. So, and then the last being the plant mycorrhizae relationship. We want to focus a little bit more in terms of research into this section because we're starting to see that by changing how the soil is interacting with the plant, you sometimes might get better, healthier looking plants or plants that are capable of fighting off diseases, weeds, and insects better. And so we wanted to know a little bit more about what to look into. And so far we've already get, been given three. Uh, mycorrhizae to look into. And as I mentioned, they are very interesting all in its own, just by looking at them. Uh, the future directions. So when we're trying to look at this. Is there a correlation between the mycorrhizal species richness and the water use? I want to say yes. I want to say we want, we really want to know whether the clerigioglomus is benefiting either peas or oats in terms of producing more. And uh, is there a, a correlation between mycorrhizal species richness and yield? That's still kind of fuzzy on my mind even, but I want to say it at least produces stability simply because it can help with water use efficiency. Is there a correlation between mycorrhizal genera and plant species? Now this is definitely a yes, as we can see that Paraglomus and diverse spora do very different things in the plants in oat pea compared to oats and peas combined together. So I want to say if there is more research done in that direction, we, we can definitely see why they do what they do and how we can basically take advantage of this. And the correlation between mycorrhizal genera and nitrogen fertilizer use. Um, if we look back at one of the slides earlier, we basically see that it does something. We're not sure what, because when you add fertilizer into the crops, the, what do you call it? The crops, the uh, oats and the peas, there is a difference between the abundance of mycorrhizae. So now we're just wondering, or what we should be wondering is, is it a good idea to add fertilizer all the time to the ground? and destroy, potentially to destroy the mycorrhizal community that is produced in the roots and the soil or not. And this is um, once again, something to figure out for 
the future whenever we get a chance to look more into mycorrhizae. And um, this is more or less my uh, research. I'm sorry for taking so long. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alan. Um, so if people have questions, please type them into the Q&A. We're actually going to save questions until the very end after um, our next presenter uh, gives their talk. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce uh, Lana Shaw. Uh, she has a master's of science from the University of Saskatchewan. She's worked for about 20 years in agronomy extension and various research roles within the government of Saskatchewan. Uh, since 2010, she's been with the Southeast Research Farm in Saskatchewan, and she's found a niche in mixed grain intercropping research since 2012. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, guys, keep on putting your questions in the Q&A and we'll answer them at the end. So I will now turn it over to Lana. Well, thank you for inviting me to talk here. I'm often up in the, the Peace River kind of area um, twice but not for the last couple of years. And um, so since we're adapting to this, to this situation, we'll do it remotely this time. Um, it, it certainly is a, the, the commute there is, it's much easier this time. So uh, my talk is going to be more about grain intercropping. I have done some similar to Alan's on, um, basically annual forages like pea oats or, or things like that. Most of my intercropping work is to do with um, seeding two grain species together and then harvesting them together. Um, so I call that mixed grain intercropping. Intercropping broadly is just intentionally growing more than one species in an agricultural setting. That's sort of my um, definition. There's and and if, if I talk about uh, monocultures or monocrops, that's where you're trying to just grow one crop at a time. It doesn't mean you only ever grow that one crop on that land. Um, you can have sequential monocrops. So um, why are we talking about mixed grain intercropping? Uh, there's some technologies and, and equipment that's making this a possibility. There, there are obstacles to doing this, of course. If there wasn't, everyone might be already doing it. But the obstacles are surmountable. It's possible to um, adapt existing equipment, existing um, plant material crops to an intercropping system. Um, it, can it be better optimized? For sure. There's lots of things that could be more optimal, more specialized, but it is possible to do it with, with kind of existing technology. And so there's a multiple observed benefits to productivity, pest reduction, harvestability, nutrient efficiency, risk mitigation, and some, something that we broadly call ecosystem services, which might include reductions in soil erosion possibly. Now, are those going to happen all the time just because you're intercropping? No, but some of the well thought out, well planned intercropping is trying to and typically does achieve much of those uh, goals. So we'll, we'll get into some of the scenarios. Um, productivity wise, I, I think we're, we're typically seeing um, 10 to 20% over yielding. So if you grow two crops at the same time, you're not expecting to get double the yield. That's not a realistic expectation. But um, 10 to 15% extra yield sort of more on average over time isn't an unrealistic expectation. And if you combine that with some uh, other reductions in uh, variable costs from use of different products, then it, it can result in more profitability over the longer term. And I would agree with the, the statement that, that there's some yield stability that comes along with this. So you might miss out on um, you know, a real big yield for one of those components, like um, you know, a absolutely fantastic lentil crop. But um, 
it, it kind of evens it out so you're you get a more dependable reliable crop and reliable productivity is really very important for agricultural success uh, this picture is just an example of a trial we did in 2017 um, one of my more successful intercrops as far as like big yields overall when you're comparing intercrop trials or in monocultures versus intercrops, you've always got to watch how successful those monocultures were. So how did the lentils do when they were growing on their own? Um, were they managed properly so that you have a, a nice big crop to compare to? And if the intercrop can still outperform a very strong monocrop of those individual crops, then, then that's showing real um, real advantages and, and gains in productivity. And this year in 2017, very low disease pressure, uh, great soil moisture, not a lot of rainfall, and, and really big crops of, of some of our crops. And this large green lentil was standing like, uh, that's two, two feet tall, great harvest, just standing straight up. And the, um, the lentil grew on their own of the same crop were pretty much flat on the ground. So we were scraping them off the ground. So just one of the examples that where if you plan it right, they, they, they doesn't mean that that's a suitable intercrop for your area, but it is for some places. Um, this isn't an easy thing to attempt and um, it takes quite a bit of planning. Starting small is a good idea and planning to learn as you're going is pretty much unavoidable. Um, so it, it's not a magic um, solution that you just put more than one crop together and everything works out fantastic. It is not really that way. Um, but there's, there's a lot of advantages that people manage to adapt to their systems. So how have we come to be caring about intercropping in this day and age? Um, there's a bit of a history of it. There was some uh, sort of some rogue researchers and rogue farmers that were doing intercropping in the late 80s, early 90s with, with pea canola or peas and rapeseed, pea and mustard, uh, partly because the genetics on the peas were, were very poor for lodging. And um, that, that went away to quite an extent once the genetics for the peas and the, the canola improved. But we've had a kind of a resurgence of interest in this um, in, the, in the last five years. There were some of the farmers that were have been doing some trial and error between 2008. Colin Rosengren is definitely one. So between 2008 and 2017, there was there were some people doing um, working out a system that that fit for them on their land, and and being quite persistent about it for some years. So it, it, during that time, it was weird and really not very trendy. Um, it's become more trendy since 2018 for whatever reason. And it's not that that's a bad thing. It's, it reflects kind of a different level of interest in it. Um, so it's, the acres have been building since 2018, more or less. Like we, we don't have a good estimate on really on acres. And Michelle Hubbard talked about that in an earlier one of these sessions. So what, what's happened is that, you know, there's ideas that were getting kicked out in the 80s and 90s that led the intercrop innovators, early adopters to, to try things out. And then, um, you know, we get involved in doing the research. And I think it's, it's the, the farmers and the researchers working fairly nicely with each other and sharing ideas and trying to keep the research really relevant to answering questions that they actually need answered. That's why we're, we're getting some traction. We're getting actually quite good traction and shockingly good traction on intercropping um, in the Northern Prairies. And, and it's, I was in a, a meeting with some European people that are trying to basically replicate some of the success we're having here in Europe because they haven't been able to get as much uptake on the at field scale as and with scaling it up into broad acre agriculture is what we've had here. So that's really neat. 
So one example where I've got a decent amount of debt, because I know a lot of people that are doing it or they'll they'll tell me what they're doing, um, is chickpea flax. So this is just in Saskatchewan. This is what the acres were doing. So you start out with a just a very small number of farmers. This number of farmers is down here. And then it that starts growing and growing. And I'm not sure what it is for 2020, what it was for 2021. Um, I think the acres and the numbers of farmers doing this will be going up for 2022 because the chickpea price is going back up. Um, so as a management tool for chickpeas, this intercropping is becoming more recognized as, as a valid agronomic technique and just one of several techniques that they're using for growing a successful chickpea crop, including for disease management, which Michelle Hubbard talked about in a previous session. And I'm not gonna talk about chickpea flax very much because I'm talking to the Northern Alberta and this isn't a really a reasonable thing to attempt in Northern Alberta. So we'll talk about the other ones. Uh, so in let's see, 2019, this would be reflecting, this was from a survey I did um, with an online, I did an online survey in preparation for a, an OP project, asking people who was intercropping and, and some of their, some, something about how they were doing this. And this was the respondents that I got. So most of them were in Saskatchewan. There's uh, about equal amounts in Manitoba and Alberta. Then there was a few international ones. Um, and the, these are the intercrops that they have tried. So some of them have obviously tried multiple different intercrops. So the, um, you know, we can see there's pea canola, chickpea flax and pea oat are quite popular. Lentil flax is also quite popular. Um, and only about about twenty percent of the intercrop farms were doing exclusively certified organic production. Um, some other percentage of them were a mix, so they might be transitional, or they might have some organic land and some non-organic land, and some of them are just straight up um, so-called conventional because well, the way they're farming isn't necessarily conventional, but the grain that they're selling is not certified organic. Um, so the median number of grain crops that they were growing was 5.5 per year. So five to six is how many grain crops that the intercropping people were typically growing in a given year, um, which tells us something about how they're integrating intercropping into their like crop sequences. They're adding more crops than what a grain farmer typically would be growing. They would most of them would pr probably typically grow four, three or four. So instead of growing the same number of crops in a shorter time period, they're generally, I, I, they seem to be adding more and, and one or two more crops at least. And uh, so 85% had at least five grain crops that they grew every year. And most did not have a great deal of experience. So two to four years experience was most frequent. And there was only 13% that had more than four years of experience, but this was done um, in, this was not done very recently. So some of those people have more experience now. And people tend to assume that intercropping farmers uh, are, you know, kind of small hobby farmers or they're farming more for ideological reasons than or you know, values than they are for profitability and, and being a real production farm. But the most frequent farm size range was 3,000 to 5,000 acres, which is a substantial farm. And 32% of the farms were larger than 5,000 acres. So there, it's not, it's not um, really small acres. It's not things that are being done on, on ultra small scale. Of course, there's, there are, you know, this is just looking at grain farmers and not anything sort of horticultural. And then, um, so of the people that were intercropping, they were, the median acres was 230. So that was the most frequent level of, of intercropping acres. And there was 12 that were doing more than a thousand acres in a given year, in, in 2019. So, um, that, that's pretty quite a big commitment 
when you consider they're having to separate all their grain. So people are maybe wondering how, whether you're seeding a forage or you're seeding a, a forage intercrop or you're seeding a grain intercrop, there's a few different ways of, of handling the seeding. Um, now, option A, which is maybe not ideal, is just mixing the seed. Um, but that could, res which for say a, a pea oat intercrop for forage would probably be fine. Um, if you were doing pea canola, I don't think it's a very good idea because the distribution is probably going to be poor. Things could settle out in the tank. Um, so can you meter two properly? Can you place the larger seeds deeper if you need to, um, depending on the size of your seeds and the type of seeding equipment you have? So that's, that's some considerations that people need to think about. And I'm not in a position to answer that for people unless you know, you have a discussion, we have a discussion about what equipment you have and, and what you're going to attempt to seed. Seeding rates is, is a, a tricky question. There's enough field scale experience and research data to at least give people a starting point for a lot of these intercrop combinations. Um, but it still takes local testing and, and try, uh, some trial and error to, to fine tune seeding rates that are working on your land and in your area. As far as fertilizer, um, people are gonna do what they think they need to do on their land. And some people are very, you know, want to keep doing fertilizer and some people are, are quite against fertilizer and some people are in between. Um, if you are using fertilizer, uh, like any kind of fertilizer that is, has a salt effect, um, you have to be careful of seed burn. And I guess that that includes organic fertilizers. You watch for salt effects and seed burn. <clears throat> um, consider variable rate technology for applying nitrogen. And you could even delay it until after emergence, possibly to see if you even need to add nitrogen to some of these intercrops because they are really not very responsive to nitrogen. You may need to add a little bit to kind of kickstart things. Um, I've seen that it happened before where the, my peas got way ahead of the canola because the canola was very nitrogen deficient and then the peas are um, have really overwhelmed the canola and are, are, are almost pulling it down. It basically becomes not really an intercrop in that scenario if you have are the, the canola is barely surviving. So there's a balance that you're trying to achieve. Um, you can preload some nutrients the previous fall, say phosphorus or, or some of those other nutrients, since you're going to be using the full capabilities of your drill, most likely to be seeding two different kinds of seeds. You may not, you might be using the fertilizer capacity to seed, say your peas and using the seed metering to seed canola or something like that. Um, don't sabotage your nitrogen factory. That's, there's not really much point in, in putting fertilizer on these intercrops because what you tend to get similar yields um, and just favor the, the non-legume. So you'd favor the canola, you'd favor the um, legumes, but then what's the point of putting the peas in there if they're just going to be out-competed? Um, so it's more efficient. And we, some of the trials we've done just shows it. It just makes more sense to um, give, the, give the, your legumes a fighting chance. If you need to give a little bit of nitrogen, then, um, then that's fine. So this is a... You were doing mixed versus alternating rows. And that's a kind of an interesting debate and a sort of a fine tuned thing that people like to play around with. You can do alternating rows. You can put some of these down mid row banders. Um, there's different benefits to each one. There's a little less competition, it seems like, between the crops if they're, altern if they're al in alternative rows. Um, but there's also, there seems to be less mixing of the roots and, and there's probably some, some benefits to roots interacting with each other in these intercrops, like with the mycorrhizae, that you're not going to get as much of with the, well, there's some trials we've 
had some hints toward that direction. And I don't think you get as good a um, weed competition of the intercrop when they're in alternating rows compared with mixed rows. But it's, it's kind of a tomato, tomato thing with that. It's, it's a preference thing. Um, so how do you harvest these intercrops? Well, the, pretty much all the intercrops that I'm working with that we're talking about growing in Western Canada, it's not two combine operations. You're not trying to somehow harvest two crops at different times. You're harvesting both of them simultaneously, uh, trying to get all, both crops into the combine. Um, maturity, that means maturity needs to match quite nicely. So in order to achieve that, sometimes that leads to swathing and desiccation to um, even up the maturity so that you can put all of that through the, the combine and, and not have too much shattering losses, not to have too much cracking. This can be hard at times. And, and it's, it's where some of the times the intercrops go sideways. So you're trying to optimize value and quality it helps if you have sort of a primary crop, usually the pulse crop, that you're trying to ensure that the quality on that is maintained. And if necessary, you're willing to sacrifice some quality on the other crop. So that might be a, might be a canola. And I know with canola prices, it, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but it doesn't really work out if all your peas fall on the ground either. So um, you can connect with more experienced farmers. Twitter has been a good place to do that. Um, I think there's some, there's some WhatsApp um, chats that are also helpful on that. And it'd be nice if, if you have um, some ability to get some producer groups or locally fired up. So the general rules for harvesting intercrops is that you're just trying to keep both of them in the combine and not crack them. So you set the combine for the larger seed and then turn down the fans just enough that you're not blowing the smaller seed out the back. You're still trying to blow most of the chaff out, um, just not blow out that smaller seed. So you play around with it um, until it takes a bit of trial and error to get things set for, for, you, for your system. Um, but this is where it also we're talking to farmers, other farmers, can help because they, there's a lot of people out there with experience on different kinds of combines and I don't have the actual settings and rotor speeds and whatever else I don't the equipment is not my forte I'm a plant nerd but I know enough people that do know a lot about equipment that that um, we can get th those kind of questions answered adequately so what about crop rotations we're applying the same basic principles of crop rotations or crop sequences, but with more complexity. So the basic um, premise or the foundation between, for crop rotations is that we're spacing plants out in time or spacing different crops out in time so that there's time for, the, um, for pest cycles to be broken. There's time for the disease and oculum to go away and the pests to not be exacerbated. So you can still accomplish that with intercrops. It just takes a little more complexity in planning. Um, you still have to think about rotating herbicides. So don't rely on group two herbicides, which is a tendency with intercropping to, to get a bit too much group two herbicides going on. You don't have to intercrop everything in your crop rotation. Most of the heavy duty intercroppers are only um, doing about half uh, of their, their crops as intercrops. And most of that is in Western Canada is oilseed pulsed into crops followed by a monocrop of a cereal. So that's why I've got these showing down at the bottom. So the cereals are your, kind of your friend for cleaning up weeds, cleaning up broadleaf leaf weeds in particular. And then you can still control your grassy weeds in the, the intercrops as long as you don't have, um, if you've got group one resistance, that would be a problem. Um, so yeah, alter, broadleaf intercrops alternated with cereal monocrops is something that people have, have had some success doing. You don't turn a three-year crop rotation into a two-year crop sequence. That just doesn't make any sense. And it's not what anyone is recommending. Of course, people are going to do what they want to do. 
but that's not the point of intercropping. You're going to be most likely introducing some other new crop that you haven't typically grown because it didn't really make sense in your area, but it may make sense when you can grow it in combination with something else. Like if you can't reliably grow peas in your area because they're, they're too hard to combine or um, they're, you've got rocks or whatever reason, sometimes people won't grow peas for all kinds of reasons, but you may be able to grow them in an intercrop. Uh, it was the same thing with our chickpeas in our area. No one with any sense in their head grows chickpeas at Redverse, but we can grow them relatively successfully in an intercrop because it changes the dynamics of those crops. It changes the disease, it changes maturity. Um, you still have to keep in mind Aphanomyces, club root, flea beetles, all of those things. Um, it changed the So um, this is the chickpea flax, pea canola. Um, there, there's no last residue left after then on pulses on their own. And that's, a, that's one of the big attractions that a lot of farmers are probably because they're trying to protect their soil. Their soil health is very important to them. That's true of a vast majority of people that are intercropping is that they've realized their soil is, is their greatest asset and they're trying to protect it and build it. So snow trapping, erosion reduction, and possibly sub stubble for winter cereals on a pea canola or say a pea oat. So there's likely benefits there. This is your entry level separation. It tends to be um, these things called dockage cleaners that are rel relatively cheap, readily available, and um, can be used for other things besides intercrops. They're, they're used to clean out weed seeds and reduce the amount of dockage and grain that you're hauling to elevators, which in your area is arguably a good idea. You've got a big distance to go to anywhere. <clears throat> So um, the key is with some of our research that we're doing is we're trying to find the balance between the crops because there's intercrop combinations that just don't work. There's, there's ratios of these crops that just don't work very well. And there's ratios that do seem to work relatively well. So we did a, um, trials in 2019 and 2020 uh, with the um, Prairie Oak, Oat Growers Association, it was the, or the SAS Goats, and funded through ADOPT. And so in this fairly busy chart here, I'm gonna try to go fairly light on charts with um, in this presentation. So, so we've got grain yield over here. These are the different locations. And the yellow bars are oats. The green bars are peas. So you can see our intercrops, the green, we've got peas and oats stacked up. So we're basically just stacking the yield in bushels per acre. And this is, this Indian head one <clears throat> is fairly typical of what you would often see. It's not an outstanding win for intercropping, but this is, this is reasonably typical. Um, where the monocrop oats were having a very good year, the peas really not as much. And the combination of the two was kind of intermediate between those. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that can sometimes, that's, that's fairly typical. And what you can also see is that, okay, this is increasing rates of oats going across this way. So it was 25, seeds per square meter all the way up to 125 seeds per square meter. So unsurprisingly, adding in more oat seed resulted in more, more oats in the mix and a bit less peas. But it, it, adding in more and more oats didn't really result in more yield. Um, in, in a lot of these cases, there was, um, we, this is at about half of a normal oat crop rate or a little less than half. You're looking at about 300 seeds per square meter for a good high recommended oat rate. Um, my monocrop oats was, was at 200, I believe. So half or a little less than half, we're getting a pretty good result with these. So what does that mean for actually efficiency of this? So land equivalency ratio, it, it's essentially, 
what percentage of overyielding are you getting? Um, if you get um, a 50% of a normal oat crop and 50% of a normal pea crop, you add those 50% and 50% together to get one. That basically means that um, it's a wash. You got an equal amount of productivity out of your intercrop as you would growing either of those two in different fields on their own. So there was some amount of overyielding here. So anywhere, anytime we're over this one, that's some overyielding. But there were situations where there was there was less than what there would have been on their own. And you know, red versus where I'm from, th that was our site was actually one of the worst, which is annoying because I was leading the project. And the reason seemed we we were having trouble with birds, bird damage on that trial, and they were they seem to be very much enjoying sitting on the peas and eating all the oats out of my peas. Um, so I think there was a bit of something weird going on there. So the, the PO intercrop often doesn't overyield a lot um, uh, for whatever reason, but it's, it's, it's reliably pretty good. So it depends on what you're trying to achieve. We, um, as far as gross value goes, okay, just move that. Um, as far as gross value goes, some of the time the the monocrops were higher, some of the time the intercrops were a little bit higher. But like this Indian head site, that was a good amount of production out of those, and so there's not any great economic loss to doing the intercropping. Whereas at Redvers, there was some problems here where the peas were having a lovely time on in monocultures, but there were some problems with the intercrops. And this, I think this was partly due to bird damage in this situation here. Um, as far as what the costs were for the intercropping, um, we think that the, the total cost was was a little bit higher for the intercrop in this case, but we weren't looking at pesticide differences. We weren't looking at the differences in um, reductions in herbicides, reductions in need for fungicides. So that wasn't a component that we could really study in this one little trial. So we just looked at, tried to look at the seed cost, the separation cost, and the nitrogen fertilizer costs. And the savings in nitrogen fertilizer basically offset the separation costs. Okay, for this crop, we, we used a, most of the sites used about half rate of nitrogen compared to the monoculture oats. So that's why there was a savings in nitrogen. We didn't do zero nitrogen on these, we did some. So there was a, a cost savings on the nitrogen. Um, but then the seed cost was a little bit high because we're going high rate or a full rate of peas. Maybe we could have got by with a little bit less peas and saved some costs on that, but I wanted to make sure I had a good strong crop of peas in there. So in conclusions, this, it shows some positive functionality. You really have to watch those separation costs because that can eat up the profits pretty quick, especially if you start getting, you know, some big, heavy, large bushel crops. When, when you're paying, for, when you, when you're, Separation costs are on a volume basis, then, and you start getting 100 bushel, 150 bushel crops that are combined. Putting that through the separation is probably going to cost about 25 cents a bushel at the um, minimum for realistic cost for, the, for a dockage cleaner. So that, that starts adding up. So you need to be aware of that. So anytime you can have higher value intercrops, uh, that helps with the, the functionality of this. And that's what a lot of the farmers are doing is trying to grow specialty crops that have relatively high value for their volume so that the separation of them doesn't become, separation cost doesn't become as onerous. So we also had a General Mills project um, that it was the contract that that the farm led, Luke Struckman uh, worked for us on it. And we, it was an interview and on-farm sort of a demo project. It's a little, little bit like some of the living labs type of idea that is being employed. 
um, in some places now. So we did, they, he did interviews with 25 current intercroppers. This was done in the spring of 2020. And then they also set, had 12, 12 that actually were completed on farm trials where it was just a side-by-side -side comparison of at least 20 acres of pea oat intercrop and at least 20 acres of oat monocrop. And we basically let them do it however they wanted. I'll, if they had questions, I'd give them advice, but we just, they just did their intercrop and their monocrops however they thought was the best way to do it. Uh, so there was no consistent difference in the yields, the oat, test weights or other quality parameters. So they varied some in certain situations, but nothing very consistent. The crop values were similar to that of monocrop oats, um, but the, the best outcomes were being achieved where there was not more than 60% of a normal oat seed density. <clears throat> so this was taking mainly taking successful oat product producers in, uh, in areas where they, they, um, they're at relatively heavy oat production zones, black, mainly the black soil zone. And they were trying to test whether adding, adding peas could be a benefit. So a lot of them were doing, quite a few of them were doing quite high oat rates with a little bit of peas added that really wasn't giving them much of any benefit. It was just kind of creating a nuisance more than anything. As far as like profits and, and separation, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So um, keeping the, going relatively higher on the P density than what they had a tendency to do and keeping the, the oat seeding rate was, were, were the combinations field scale that were working relatively well. And there's good reason to try to maximize value here by using niche pea types. So you're forage, producing forage pea seed, producing uh, the maple peas sometimes were worth more. They're hard to produce as a monoculture because they lodge like that. Um, anything where it's a higher end, difficult to grow pea was there was a um, opportunities with those. And I've, that oat is available at oatnews.org. Um, if anyone wants to check out that full report. So um, there's other research trials that are ongoing that have not been written up and I don't have the results for them yet. Um, there's a chickpea flax trial that's that's been going on since 2019. We've generated quite a bit of data from that, but um, we don't have the 2021 data package ready yet. Uh, Melanie Reed did an MSC project on chickpea flax and pea mustard that looked at um, some of the nitrogen dynamics. They tried looking at mycorrhizae, but um, there was you know, problems with, with the collection and storage of them. It, it didn't work out, um, but um, soluble, they found some really interesting results on soluble organic carbon, where there was more soluble organic carbon in that uh, the root zone um, in the soil around the root zone than there was in the monocultures. So that, that was a really interesting result that I'm, I'm gonna get more data on when she finishes writing up her thesis. That's just being finished. Uh, Dr. Quilu out of Swift Current has a pea oat and pea canola intercrop trial that's that for grain. Um, they, they may have some results that are interesting to forage producers, but the intent is to take it to grain. And when we're looking at three different nitrogen regimes for each of the pea oat and pea canola, and then we have the, or the, the monocultures grown at their typical nitrogen regimes for comparison. Uh, I've got one going on that's perennial ryegrass and oat, where we're trying to establish perennial ryegrass as a seed crop and looking at how much oats can we add in there um, and not have, and, and see what it, it positive or detrimental effects that oat has versus just seeding ryegrass alone. Uh, so we're in the first year of that, we established the perennial ryegrass in 2021. And in 2022, we're, we're gonna be seeing how much of that perennial ryegrass 
has survived, what are the stands like, and what is the, what is this, my cat has decided to join the presentation. Um, and what is the, um, the, the seed yield for the perennial ryegrass? Um, and then Dr. Shamra Chatterton is leading a project with looking at the effect of intercropping of a number of different crop combinations on a phantomyces root rot in pea. So all of the intercrop combinations include peas. Um, so intercropping is a big change from what people are used to. It's a way of trying to, to get away from some of the two-year intercrop or two-year crop rotations that a lot of places have, have become reliant on because they're having trouble seeing how they get more crops into their crop sequence and have them uh, working for them. Um, people want change, but it, it takes actually changing practices to really be part of the change. And my theory on that is you change or you have to, you'll have more choices. Um, there, we're being forced into some change due to herbs resistant root and all of those things. So I think there's some merit in, in figuring out how to adapt more diversity before things really get go sideways. Because some of these techniques work really well before you have really bad herbicide resistant weed problems or before you have a bad aphanomyces problem, before you have a bad club root problem. And it may prevent some of those from developing as much. So you start, uh, where do you start? You, you try to figure out what are, what are you trying to accomplish? What does success look like for you? And are, are those goals achievable or are you better off just not, not going ahead with it? Um, so you have to adjust your expectations adjust your eyeballs, your farmer eyeballs, basically for more diversity, because the whole thing is going to, we're used to looking at thinking that uniformity and only seeing one plant on the entire field is ideal. And this is not what these crops look like. They do not look uniform. There'll be areas where there's more of one crop than another. And that's a feature of this system, not a bug, but you have to adjust your expectations of what a good field looks like. So expect that to happen. And then you, there's more unpredictability in these that it, you don't know for sure what, what's going to happen. You've got to be ready to go on the fly. You give yourself the gift of time and patience. If you're only interested in trying this out for one year and if it's not a resounding success, then, then quitting, well, you should probably just not bother. Um, it's, it's going to take a little while and a little commitment to fine tune it for your um, for your area. Goals for people that make this work is resiliency and profitability. Yes, profitability is really what is going to drive the longevity of farms, as well as the resiliency, and that's kind of a throwaway word, but um, having to depend on profitable crops that, that maintain quality is very important. There's a lot of different things that you could possibly grow. Some of these are more feasible than others in up in the piece. So there's a bunch of these that probably wouldn't I wouldn't even be on the list in your area. Um, you know what things you can possibly grow, and and you've got quite a, a wealth of little um, applied research farms that could help narrow down this list, or at least figure out which things are are worth a try. And you can do these in combination with, um, with forage seed production. Forage seed production, I know in your area is, is pretty important. So you can use, you could do an intercrop and underseed for seed potentially. There's a lot of different combinations that are interesting, that work, but um, it just depends on your area what what is feasible. But the pulses are kind of foundational to this system because they're not, then you're not competing for the same nitrogen source. There's some mutual benefits that can go on. There's about 20% of the nitrogen from the pulses 
can be transferred to the non-pulse. It's probably happening relatively later in the season. So you might have more protein or something on, on some of your crops because of it. You, see, you don't count on the pulses to be supplying all of the nitrogen needs of your non-pulse, but um, it, you're basically for, forcing them to scavenge for, for enough nitrogen or to get by. So uh, if you're figuring out what you might want to intercrop, you need to figure out if you're not organic, what do you want, what do you want to or need to be able to spray to be able to control the weeds that you need to control? Uh, what can you sell or use? Uh, can you separate efficiently? Um, don't plant things together that you can't separate if you can't make use of or sell mixed grain. <clears throat> um, you got to watch herbicide residuals now for two crops and herbicide residuals was a big problem in 2021. So be careful of those and then be aware that you're going to have to deal with volunteers in some fashion. So that's why some of these intercrops work well following a cereal because you, you've got at least some options of controlling volunteers. Uh, canola vol volunteers can be fairly annoying. Um, so be careful with those. Uh, crop factors, you've got competitive ability between the two different crops that can change depending on environmental conditions. And they also change with variety and market class traits. So some types of peas are the leafier types, the big vinier types. Most of those are quite competitive versus the semi-leafless ones that are relatively short. They're not as competitive with something like an oat, or they don't seem to be. And even with canola, there some of them are. There's varying amounts of of competitive ability. We're trying to match maturity, so pick your varieties and market classes accordingly. Canola tends to be quite a bit later than the peas, at least in most areas. So you go as early a canola as you can find, and as late a pea as you can manage. There's um, you're also watching harvest loss potential, and that can be influenced by varieties and market classes. Um, and then watch your moisture. So there's, there's a social component to this intercropping trend. Um, it's, it's very isolating to be trying to attempt this without having other farmers to talk to about it or other people that think, you know, what you're doing is really interesting and worth doing. Um, and you're not likely to find neighbors necessarily they're more they're, they're more likely to be discouraging than offering you any helpful advice or being encouraging so it, it takes effort to build that network um, and I highly recommend people put, um, try to reach out to people to do that or go to events where people are doing interpreting right? um, get to know some of the the people with more experience and if in the right direction on that front or other things, um, this, is, this is how you uh, get a hold of me. Um, I'm on Twitter quite a bit there with the Twitter handle. Um, that's something I recommend. And, and I usually respond to emails if you've got questions. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Um, I guess if uh, we're waiting for people to type in their questions in the Q&A in the bottom, um, I guess I do have a question. You've, you've done it now for over a decade um, of intercropping. Have you noticed that pest pressures have changed on your site at all? Um, just with like improvements in soil health with intercropping or um, just with like the rotations and stuff like that, have you seen like the change in like what types of weeds you've had over the years or um, okay. any so difference in that way? We do intercropping trials. We also do monoculture trials, like all different kinds of crop trials. So only a very small amount of our land that the farm actually owns is in intercropping trials on a given year. Um, and then the other years when we're not, uh, you know, we, we only have plots on the land every fourth year. So the other years, those are, are in monocultures. 
Um, so that we, we're not, I'm not in a position to answer that. Um, of the farmers that have been employing intercrops on the same land for multiple years, they do tend to get a, they've got a bit of a species shift. Uh, like Derek Axton's having trouble with uh, black medic. Um, and he, like he's, it's, he's got enough of it that it's a competition problem, but it's also a, a problem to separate it from his flax. Um, and that's not a very typical weed that people have a lot of. It's just something that's kind of developed because he changed his cropping system and, and the, 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 there will be weeds that will adapt to that if you keep doing something relatively similar for some period of time. Um, so it, you just change things and adapt over time. Um, I don't think you see, you're probably gonna see less of things like wild oats because wild oats loves nitrogen fertilizer. Nitrogen fertilizer makes oats um, germinate. Like they, they will respond to nitrogen fertilizer to germinate in the row with the, right beside the fertilizer. <coughs> so some of the weeds, you, you, they may not germinate if you're reducing or eliminating some of the fertilizer applications. Um, uh, other than that, like we still got, there's still issues, but um, there tends to be less disease in the intercrops. And then you're liable to see more beneficial insects, a little bit less pest pressure, but you're still susceptible to whatever's going on in the local area. So no questions. Is anybody still there? Seems like it. Oh, um, somebody has. I hope you can hear me well well enough. I just noticed the comment about I should turn off the video camera. So a little late for that. Hello. Can you get me? Okay, yeah. Hi. <clears throat> yeah, my question goes to Alan. Eh? I didn't quite get, uh, I didn't quite understand him. Or I didn't quite get him when he, he talked about the, uh, the way the, uh, the, uh, the pea and the oat and the, yeah, the intercrop was done. Was it alternate or was it the same row seeding? Right. So for our project in, um, Fairview, it was all mixed intercropping. So they were all seated together in the same row. Okay. Yeah. yeah so the, yeah. So the question is, uh, if uh, if it were different, if there were um, alternate seeding, do you think there would have been a difference, especially for the mycorrhiza? The mycorrhiza. Uh, it's actually something pretty curious to think about, since um, you know when we take the the plugs from the soil or taking it from the rose itself so i i would actually have to think about how you would need to take those plugs my guess is you're going to see some mycorrhizal interaction but probably not as much as you would when it's completely mixed with each other just simply because of how close the roots would be in a mixed scenario compared to when it's just kind of um alternating because um it, I think the spacing between the plants are different mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. It's all quite spaced out. And um, the, what is it? Horizontal growth of certain plants aren't as good as others. I think oats are fine, but peas and canola are kind of questionable in terms of growing out sideways. Or lateral growth, yeah. I would okay. I would agree with, with what you're saying that uh, like, the, the the amount of time that you have root interaction is going to be longer in a mixed row than it is in alternating rows because yes eventually those roots might grow enough that they're interacting with each other but then by then you might only have a short amount of growth left and probably not enough for the microbiology to really adapt to that scene okay thank you Hey, we did have a question come up. Um, how effective do you think intercropping would be even on um, 
on even drier sites based on the findings you have had so far? Um, I guess I could try to answer this. Um, <laughs> uh, we did have a very dry year. If it goes any drier, I would only assume that it'll do better than monocropping, but would it do, you know, good? Would it not lead to crop failure? That's um, really dependent on, you know, how dry we're going to get and um, how much moisture is left in the soil by that time, because, you know, there, there's a, um, ultimately there is a limit to how much water you still need to sustain cropping in general. So um, that's, um, Hopefully it never happens to the point where intercropping also fails. That's kind of what I, I'm thinking. We 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 saw some pretty extreme, you know, I, I wasn't out to see it personally, but there was a lot of pretty extreme situations going on in Saskatchewan, Alberta in 2021. And so what I was mainly hearing was that intercropping wasn't particularly worse than the monocrops. Um, it wasn't, wasn't necessarily most of the time obviously better um money wise it probably worked out similarly maybe a little bit better um but it really depend on what depends on what particular combination they were looking at like monocrop chickpeas was may have ended up being really good this year because super low disease pressure and really good prices on the chickpeas it depends it depends on relative prices of those two crops uh also but it does tend to be in the wetter years that the intercrops really shine because there's more potential for lodging, there's more disease pressure. Um, and, and that's when I've really seen some of the bigger positive effects of intercropping showing up. I, I think in 2020, we did see intercropping doing substantial with a lot of fertilizer in the oats and peas and completely outperforming the oats. So I, I do agree with that part. Um, you definitely do see some things when it gets wet like that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Lance has a question of what seed separator has worked best for you? Okay, so uh, we, we do things on very small scale. We've got this something called a clipper office tester. And so it's it's got screens and it's got a little bit of uh, it's got a fan and that does the separation. So um, in terms of what I know of like field scale stuff, the usually there's a, a, a kind of a sequence of different units. So you, you have something that they sometimes call a scalper or um, something where, where it's some kind of a rotary screen or a shaking screen. And then, um, and then you oftentimes an air or uh, something that's separating based on, on uh, like wind speed and how it reacts uh, based on a, an air separation. So it's usually some kind of a tandem thing because the air separation alone is not going to accomplish it. And the screening alone generally doesn't accomplish it without multiple rounds of, of separation. But doing both the ro rotary, some kind of screening mechanism and using air to separate usually gets pretty darn close to the what they need. Sometimes people end up having to have recourse to uh, color color sorters, color separation. And like the cost of that is is has just come down hugely from I wouldn't have thought 10, 15 years ago that you could color sort mustard, <laughs> canola out of mustard or something. But it's actually possible to do that. It's just expensive, but it's not if you've got not a huge amount of, of mustard to deal with and it's relatively worth a lot, it might be worthwhile to run it through a color sorter if it otherwise isn't really worth anything. Um, so those are some of the options. It, it's an area that does need more development to optimize for grain intercrops. It tends to work better if you have a larger amount of, of the larger seed like peas and a relatively smaller ratio of the small seed because most of the rotary screens and the setups are are more optimized for kind of a, a thing where they're they're kind of designed to screen out weed seeds out of a larger seed. So if you have a 50-50 mix, that could 
be quite slow and cumbersome. Okay, or if yeah, you have no. lots of canola and hardly any peas, that is going to be a pain to separate. Yeah, no, thanks, Lana. I uh, no, the reason why I was asking too is um, on one of the producers uh, that we had last last week, I guess, uh, they'd mentioned they had a quick clean and they'd mentioned just the volume of of um, seeds that they were putting through, uh, you know, sometimes they had issues with with processing it and it took a long time and sometimes they had to pre to do it twice or three times. And uh, so I was just wondering if there were other options other than this uh, kind of dockage cleaner and I'm sure there are, but yeah. It's, there uh, is, it's kind of an entry level thing where if people are just wanting to try out intercropping then that's what they do. If they want to get more serious with it then there's there's some other ones like, you know, between flamins and, and, you know, they've got lots of different units that that can be put in sequence uh, and sometimes they're they're you know be mobile ones that are put on a trailer where you can take it out to the field and have a few of these on a big trailer and then and then try to do your cleaning out in the field instead of in the yard um, it just depends what people want to do um, colin rosengren's got um it all set up in his bin yard where his it it he just dumps it into dumps the grain into a pit and it automatically um fires up the, the augers to take it up to a, a grain cleaner. It goes off into two or three different legs and off into the bins separated and, mm -hmm. and it's basically automated. Um, so yeah. that's kind of top level of, of and he, so he, he, everything is separated as they're combining, but that's oh. a big investment in having it set up that way. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay no, that's good thank you yep yeah yep um so there was a comment in the chat um to please touch base again on how adding which fertilizers exactly affect the intergropping they understand the salt burn but they're just looking at the other interactions i think okay so um scott chalmers who you know had you've had here at, earlier um was finding that they were getting a positive response on phosphate for these intercrops. Like phosphate is important for nitrogen fixation. And so having some phosphate fertilization it is, is a good idea. And if you can do some seed placed phos with one of your, uh, still and manage to accomplish that somehow, that's a good thing. Um, the nitrogen is, you can change the, balance between the crops or influence your outcome with the amount of nitrogen that's available. And so really high nitrogen soils generally aren't great, but um, one of the opportunities people are seeing with maybe intercropping for 2022 is they could be going on to some higher nitrogen and with say a pea canola intercrop where just growing peas on that land would be kind of a waste of that nitrogen. Whereas at least in a combination, you're going to make use of the relatively high available nitrogen and maybe it won't be as much of a negative. So in that case, I, if you had relatively high nitrogen in the soil, I wouldn't be as concerned about putting some starter nitrogen down. If you have very low starting nitrogen or soil nitrogen, then probably some kind of a starter nitrogen idea is a good idea. And, and then what you can do is check strips. like. If I had an actual commercial farm, I would have way too many check strips. It's probably a good reason why I don't have a commercial farm. Um, but I do encourage people to try doing uh, doing a few of those so that you can see what effect, if find out if you were missing out on, on some yield, if you should have put down some fertilizer or if that fertilizer was not really doing you any good. You're not going to know until you do some, some test strips to find out. I thought I'd tack on a little bit more to that. Um, on the phosphate topic, it's pretty interesting because in the mycorrhizal community, there's a lot of talk about how phosphate actually um, facilitates uh, better nitri or was it nutrient uptake, actually. Um, so there's probably something to talk about there. Um, not too sure if it applies to annuals, 
it might apply a little bit more to perennials when they're established, where the phosphate actually comes to uh, fruition to actually make it so that uptake is easier for the plants. Um, in terms of nitrogen, what I think what I noticed anyways, walking through our plots in Fairview, when you have excess nitrogen for the oat pea intercropping, you see less peas and more oats. With um, canola and peas, on the other hand, um, it really depends on what's going on in your soil, <laughs> funny enough. Um, generally, with the oat pea uh, or oat canola intercropping, a little bit more fertilizer is okay, but you you can easily overload both crops with fertilizer in terms of nitrogen really quickly. That's kind of what we've noticed in those two years when we did the intercropping experience. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, don't think there's any other questions at this time. So I want to thank both Lena and Alan for presenting today. It was fabulous to hear. Um, hopefully we see more intercrops in the future. I know um, I know the, the picture of seeing that pristine monocrop is something that we all have to get out of our head because I think uh, I was probably looking at some intercrops this year and I was like thinking to myself, like what a dirty, dirty looking field, but it's, it's dirty. actually dirty. Yeah, exactly. And it's a totally different mindset and it's sometimes a little bit hard because I was once a weed inspector and I think I always am just looking for weeds and um, yeah, I think it's, it's something that we all have to get our mindset to change over. So yeah, it's a, it's a paradigm shift. Like, yes, it's just another management tool, but it's still kind of a paradigm shift and, and you have to retrain your, your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully we see a little bit more dirty fields in the future. <laughs> yeah, a little bit dirty. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much. And, um, I hope that everybody, uh, enjoyed this and have a wonderful day. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for having me too. I had fun learning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much.